the second book of Kings, chapter 4, just a few verses, then we'll have a word of prayer before we get into the study of it. Second book of Kings, chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou now hast that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbours, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. Let's just have a word of prayer together, shall we, for a moment. What I'd like to do with you for a little while this morning is uh, speak about the fullness of the Holy Ghost. Or to use Paul's uh, words from Philippians, I think it's chapter 1, verse 19. The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I think possibly in some churches there is a reluctance, in fact it's been my experience really that there's almost a fear of the Holy Spirit and a, something of a, a slight distaste for perhaps a message titled the fullness of the Holy Ghost because we understand that uh, the Holy Ghost's business is to speak to us of Christ. This is made perfectly clear in John 16 where the Lord Jesus tells his disciples about the ministry of the Holy Spirit where, when he comes and we see don't we too much of an emphasis in many a place on the Holy Spirit to the neglect of the name and the praise of the Lord Jesus and that's clearly wrong and in my from my limited experience of this very often where the Holy Spirit is made the most of generally speaking the gospel isn't preached and that makes me wonder whether really it's the Holy Spirit at, at all that is in action and I think in many instances that isn't so but we can I think go too far the other way and refuse to see what the scripture would teach us from time to time about the fullness of the Holy Spirit when I got saved my first church although the guy that used to come and see me the two men that used to come and see me who were involved in me coming to Christ. One was a Gideon, who was an elder in a brethren church, and he was a most impressive chap because basically because of his gentleness and his patience. And he used to come and see me every fortnight. So I was just a lost sinner, depressed and miserable. And he used to come and see me every fortnight. And I, I, probably half the time I didn't know what he was talking about, but I was impressed with him. I was impressed with his gentleness. I was impressed with his kindness. I was impressed with just. Uh, just how he would share the scriptures with me and I couldn't have put my finger on quite what it was but something was leading me and of course now I know that the Holy Spirit was leading me to the Lord and then there was another younger evangelical brother uh, who also came to witness to me and eventually I understood uh, well what, what that, the way they put it to me was I needed to receive Jesus Christ so that's what I did and, that, and I got the assurance that, that my salvation was real but I didn't go to either of those churches. I went to a Pentecostal church where Gene and I met. And of course, you, d you tend to hear a little more about the Holy Ghost in a Pentecostal church, which is pro probably why I refer more to the Holy Spirit than maybe you'd find in many a brethren church. But try not to dismiss me out right here. Um, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The Lord has been just reminding me about this recently because um, if I was to ask you what the doldrums are, uh, you'd probably say, well, it's being miserable. 
Uh, and you know, I have my days in the doldrums. But I wonder how many of you know where the term originates. Some of you, I'm sure you do. That it's a place near the equator where the wind doesn't blow. Sometimes, sometimes it's very stormy apparently. But sometimes the wind just doesn't blow. And in the, in the old days of the sailing ships, you could be stuck in the doldrums for weeks. You'd never moved. And we, we have taken that uh, concept, as you were, and we, if you will, and we've applied it sometimes to being down in the dumps. And uh, before I got saved, and part of the, the way that the Lord led me to him was through a serious bout of depression. I had a mental breakdown, nervous breakdown when I was 24. And the Lord used that, and, I, and that taught me very much, you know, that sometimes the hardest and most unpleasant things in, the, in our lives are the greatest opportunities for the Lord to teach. And I'm not the only one that understands this here, I'm quite sure. Um, and uh, it wasn't until I got saved that I began to read the promises of God that I began to come out of that, of that gloomy place. But even now, at times, I have spates, and maybe you do, I don't know, maybe you have spates in the doldrums and I'll tell you what it how it feels to me it's just like all the wind has got out of my sails that's the way it feels uh, you sometimes you don't see it so much now but you used to see outside churches I will get to the scriptures in a moment you used to see outside churches posters saying uh, if God seems far away who moved and of course we're supposed to say well I did it's not always the case <laughs> sometimes God moves away uh, there was a bishop in the Church of England called Hugh Latimer. He, he perished for his faith in 1555 during the reign of Mary. And uh, now I don't know whether I can... I think I might be able to get the quote. I think I've got the back of it here. There's a quote from Hugh Latimer which just kind of underscores this thing about the Lord sometimes moving away. Have I got it here? Latimer writes to Nicholas Ridley, Pray for me, I say, pray for me. For I am sometimes so fearful that I'll creep into a mouse hole. Sometimes God doth visit me again with his comforts, so he cometh and goeth to teach me to feel and to know my infirmity. And there are times, and it, it, sometimes it's once a week, sometimes once a fortnight, I don't know really, but it seems about that kind of thing, when it's like all the wind has gone out of my sails. And I'm in the doldrums. And I might have got up in the morning thinking I'm going to do this today, and I'm going to do that today, and I'm going to pray for so and so, and I'm going to read such and such a passage, and I'm going to study stuff, and all I do is end up putting on bargain hunt or whatever, because the wind is all gone. And I'm aware that the wind is all gone, and it's, it's like the Lord moved away. Now, we're never forgotten. You know we're never forgotten. I will never leave the North Atlantic. But sometimes he just stands back a while, and in those situations, as Latimer says, we see our infirmity, we realise our weakness. Those, those withdrawings, if I can call it that, are very important. And then I remembered that um, in, I think it's First Peter, First or Second Peter, I think it's First Peter, talks about how holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the Greek boys tell us that that moving is like the ships being blown along by the wind. And the Lord Jesus himself, he says John 3, refers to the Holy Spirit as a wind. So there is some scriptural legitimacy in using this concept of the, the Holy Spirit as a wind filling our sails. And um, what I want to just bring home to you this morning, amongst other things, is that this is absolutely essential. This help and power and blessing of the Holy Spirit. Try not to, miss it, try not to dismiss it as mere Pentecostalism, because I don't think it is. Yes, they may go over the top. Yes, they may go too far. But the concept is a biblical one. I need my sails full with the Holy Spirit. And we could, look at the, we could look at the person of the Holy Spirit and we could look at his ministries in a number of ways. But he is the one that moves me. And I find more and more, if I'm studying the scriptures so often, I was saying to the Lord yesterday, preparing for last night, and I say it so often, I sit at the table with my Bible in front of me and I'm afraid. Because I've got a duty to minister in the evening, I've got a duty, and I don't know, after all these years, and after God never disappointing me, I, I still know that I, without God I can do nothing. The, the Lord Jesus teaches us this in John 15, when he speaks of the vine. Without me, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, there are two or three, in fact, there's three situations we're going to look at this morning uh, that speak of the fullness and the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And I will say this, 
if there is a touch and a blessing an enabling of the Holy Ghost in your life and mine it will be for the glory and for the raising and the praising of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and this is how we can discern in these so called spirit filled churches some of them that it isn't the Holy Ghost because Jesus never gets the glory the preacher gets the glory or the, and the money or the singers get the glory or the choir gets the glory or some soloist gets the glory or the Christian comedian gets the glory but Jesus doesn't get it that is not the ministry of the Holy Spirit so because we understand and, and quite rightly that the Holy Spirit's business is to magnify Christ be careful not to dismiss the Holy Spirit altogether we need that fullness, we need that enabling, we need that power. He is, after all, God Almighty, the third person of the Trinity. So we read about this woman here. Let's just have a little a bit of a look at this woman here. There cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Now you may have heard it said that the New Testament in the Old lies hid. I think that's right. And the Old Testament in the New is revealed. And when you read New Testament teaching, say in the book of Romans, there are many places in the Old Testament where those things are illustrated and I think the truth that's illustrated here we find in Romans 7. So I'll just read you a few verses from Romans 7 which this passage in 2 Kings 4 I believe illustrates. Romans chapter 7. This chapter is all about, can I put it like this, the inadequacy of the flesh. It's all about that helplessness that a man finds who is a Christian but finds that he's constantly frustrated, constantly failing. This is, the, this is the, what's going on in Romans 7. But notice, if you will, as we read just a few verses from here, how we're seeing the doctrine, if you will, that's illustrated in 2 Kings 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them, this is verse 1 of Romans 7, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, that so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that she should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the flesh did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So here in connection, we're reading about a woman who is, who is dead to the law because the law, her husband has died. But then having been died to the law, having broken that relationship for the law, it says that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's what 2 Kings 4 is all about. We have a woman here whose husband has died. It seems to me she speaks of a Christian. Not just a woman, but a Christian, man or woman, who understands that he's not under the law, but he's still bound. Now I suggest she represents a Christian because she has a pot of oil. And oil of course is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. In the Bible everywhere we find oil we're, we're, we're taught of the Holy Ghost. So I suggest to you that she, is, she represents the Christian who has the oil but she's still in bondage. She's still thinking about her husband. He was a good man. The law is good says Paul. He was a good man. And while she was under his care, things went well. But you see, he couldn't, after he died, he could no longer provide for her needs. And so I suggest to you, and I hope this will become clearer as we move through these few verses, that here we have a person, a woman, a widow, who represents the Christian who is in bondage and doesn't know how to find deliverance from bondage, the claims of the law. 
the claims of debtors. We have these claims all the time. Bills come through my door regularly. Sometimes I bump into the postman and I say, if it's a bill, you can keep it. But he doesn't keep it, he gives me the bill. And you know, this is part of living. We have to eat, we have to drink, we need shelter. Debts are uh, an unfortunate part of living. So when we're thinking about the creditor, we're thinking first of all about the law, but also of, of just the necessities of life. We have to find those resources. And this poor woman here, no longer does she doesn't she has got the answer but she doesn't know she's got the answer again this is the truth of many a christian you might be interested perhaps some time to read the testimony or maybe you won't of, of major ian thomas major ian thomas extraordinary character he got saved as a young man he uh he had a promising career uh, but felt that the lord was calling him out of university and he served the Lord for all he was worth until he absolutely wore himself out. Absolutely wore himself to a frazzle. And then he realised that he, he was in this position of this widow here. He, he hadn't learned yet how to trust the Holy Spirit. Well, he learned that and his ministry just took off. And his books are, are a great and a, blessing, a blessed thing to read. So here's the woman. She's in debt. The creditor has come. The Lord is constantly making demands upon us. The scriptures make demands upon us. The world makes demands upon us. Sinners inadvertently make demands. Paul says, I am a debtor to all men. So that's another debt that we owe. How can we meet all this need? How can we meet all, this, all these demands? Well, she did the right thing. She says, they cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha. Now, Elisha is very suggestive to me of the Lord Jesus here. That's the first thing you do, you go to him. So whatever the need is, my God shall supply, this is a wonderful blessing when I got hold of this, it was my verse at my baptism, my God, Philippians 4.19, shall supply all your need, not just what you want, but what you need, he may not provide what you want, but he will supply all your need, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, when I got saved and got baptised in the Pentecostal church where Gene and I met, um, I haven't got much money. Whether they picked up on that, I don't know. I know when, we, when I proposed to Gene, I hadn't got two acnes to rub together and I used to give it a tenner a week towards our first, uh, our first little flat. Um, and I think they probably thought in the church, you know, this guy hasn't got two acnes to rub together. But they were a godly lot, I'll say that for them. They weren't quite so raving as many a charismatic church. There were some great godly men there. And I'm sure they'd prayed for me and sought the Lord about the, the verse to give me for my baptism. And that was the verse they gave to me. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by, by Christ Jesus. And in those early days, I don't mean saved a year or two maybe, I thought in terms of material things. But the Lord does, in fact, there are more important things in some respects. There are more important things than material things. And God will supply those too. All your need. It may be you find your heart's cold, as I frequently do. Jesus is there to meet that need. Maybe you find you lack wisdom sometimes. The Lord Jesus is there. He is made unto us wisdom and redemption. Jesus is there to supply that need. It isn't just material things. He will provide those. And, and you know, we need to get a hold of this. But he will provide the deeper needs too. I, I don't know whether you'd agree with me. I'm not sure even Jean agrees with me about this. But uh, I sometimes say that the number of times the phone rings is inversely, proportion, inversely proportional to one's growth in age. As we get older, the phone seems to get quieter. We'll go away for a week. Um, and I've had no emails. <laughs> We've been away for a week. I've had no emails and the phone might have rung once. So when I press the message, there's nobody there. And, uh, you know, but Jean thinks differently. You might like to talk to her about that. But, you know, and, and I think a lot of older people are, are suffer with loneliness. And I can understand that. I suffer with it. And I'm, you know, Jean and I are happily married. Um, and, I, you know, I love her and it's, we have a great life together. But I still get touches of loneliness because I've seen so many friends come and go. Um, like you, you know, we, we've had our batterings through life. But Jesus is there to meet that need too. My God shall supply all your need by Christ Jesus. So she does the right thing. She goes to Elisha and I'm suggesting to you that we go to Jesus. 
And he says, Elisha, verse 2, said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? Um, and she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, but a save a pot of oil. In other words, let me put it like this way. This way, I've got the Holy Spirit, but it's not much. But actually, it turned out to be everything she needed. And we, if you're a Christian today, and I think we all are here, then you have the Holy Spirit. You have a pot of oil. And it's that pot of oil. It's not you, nor me. It's not our strength. It's that pot of oil. It's that filling, that presence of the Holy Ghost, which God can use in you and I to do to get us out of debt, to get us out of bondage. We're thinking here about bondage. We're thinking here about the pressure to maintain, we could say, righteousness in a godless world. That's a great need we have. Or just to keep our heads above water financially. All of these things, we have a pot of oil. But it must have stopped there. He said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbours, even the empty vessels, borrow not a few and when thou art coming thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out she might say i haven't got much pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full i got some insight into this many years ago a good few years ago when i was out on the street in birmingham i can't remember on this particular occasion whether i was alone or whether there was another brother with me or two and uh, I don't remember on the occasion whether I was just passing out tracts or preaching but I was so blessed I was when I came away I was just walking on air and I realized then it was because the little bit of oil that I'd got I had poured out and as I poured it out it just kept coming it just kept coming Whatever your, you feel your ministry is, and you might feel it's very small, it is in giving that, it is pouring that out that God just keeps filling you up. And it brings great joy. The Holy Spirit again it is symbolised by wine, and wine speaks of joy. The fullness of the Spirit will bring joy as we read the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. And I, and I saw then in my experience that as I've been giving the little bit of ability that I have, and I've said to you many times, I'm not an evangelist, I was blessed, so blessed. And the abundant life comes when you give what you've got. It might not be much. She hadn't got much. In fact, she thought, as so many Christians do, I'm not gifted. We might put it like this. I've nothing save a pot of oil. She, she'd overlooked it really but if you're saved today you have the pot of oil and you have in that pot of oil which is in the Holy Ghost all the resource you need to fulfill the ministry that God has given to you but we must give that little to begin with so we find that she does what she's told this is the next important thing so she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out so you know you hear the message like this and it's possible again just to go away as some might might do uh, and just say oh we we have uh, colleagues spoke to us about this pot of oil you know this morning from six. that was interesting but we need to be asking ourselves what's the ministry that God's given to me what 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 is the little thing I can do for the Lord today and it's as we begin to give that little bit that the, the oil, you just find you get fuller and fuller and you you don't feel you don't feel the bondage anymore I love the story of the blind man in John 9 here was a guy John 9 blind from birth What's the term? I can't remember what the term is uh, from the womb. I can't remember there's a term for that, isn't there? But he was blind from birth anyway, and he was sat at the gate begging. And when Jesus came along, he gave him his sight, and he didn't need to beg anymore. 
We don't need to beg if we are the Lord's. We look to the Lord. We cry out to Elisha. We call out to the Lord Jesus. He will show us, he will tell us what to do and he shall supply all our need. But some faith and some obedience is required. When you are resolved that you will serve the Lord, the Lord will frequently put you in impossible situations. And you might say to yourself, did I make a mistake? Some of you have been there, maybe you've all been there. You, you did what you felt sure God wanted you to do. And look where I am. Lord, what have you done to me? Look at the situation I'm in. And I felt sure this was where you'd called me. But God, as Trap says, he loves to bring his people to the very edge of the cliff. Even till the ground crumbles beneath their feet. And then he delivers. Abraham had got the knife in his hand before God said stop. And this is the way, you, it's the timing very often shows you that this is the hand of the Lord. Think about when the Lord Jesus was in the boat and the storm came down on Galilee. And the Lord Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. Suppose it hadn't stopped, the storm hadn't stopped for another 48 hours. Do you think the disciples would be depressed? It was the fact that when Jesus spoke, the situation changed immediately. And if you sometimes find yourself in an extremity you call upon the Lord in fact what I'm saying to you is he will often bring you to extremity it's not that you're disobedient sometimes you get there because you've stepped out in faith and he expects us to, to do the impossible I, sound like, I know I sound like one of the American black guys with 30,000 in the church but the Lord will often expect us to do the impossible because then we must rely upon him see she's told to pour I mean naturally speaking this is a ridiculous thing she's got a little drop of oil that's all she's got and Elisha says go and get all these vessels and fill them up and she doesn't say to her sons that's a balmy idea don't waste your time we'll just you know I'll cook with what I've got and that's it she does as she's told and the word of God becomes effective in your life and in mine when we first believe it and secondly we obey it and it doesn't work until we do obey it as we were thinking last night in the Sermon on the Mount chapter 7 they both, those, both those men that built on foundations, they both heard the word, but one of them paid attention and obeyed the word and his house stood. We could cite many and many an example, couldn't we? You remember when Moses brought the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt? Wonderful. There's no question that God was doing great things for Israel and he powerfully brought them out. And in no time at all, what do they find? There's the sea in front of them and the Egyptians have come out after them. God brought them out, but now they're really in a pickle. As they say in the States, they're really between a rock and a hard place. And the Lord will do this, and he will do it oftentimes when you have, you are quite sure that you've taken the right steps. Because what he wants to teach us is that he can move when moving is necessary. He can do what's impossible when you and I are in an impossible situation. And he, as this passage teaches us, can supply all our needs. It came to pass that when the vessels were full, verse 6, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more than the oil stayed. According to your faith, so be it unto you. If she had said, Get me two pots, she wouldn't have had much oil. I don't know, we're not told how many vessels, probably quite a few. But as long as she, as, as much as she believed, as many vessels as she fetched, those he filled. But it was according to her faith. And God will deal with us according to our faith. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, live thou and thy children of the rest. Now, some brothers, good men, don't mind telling the congregation or sending out a letter saying, We need so much money. Personally, I don't like that approach. I would rather just go to the Lord. I don't know, Andrew's nodding, and some of you feel the same way. I would rather go to the Lord and say, Lord, I've got this need. George Muller. Read the, life, read the life story of George Muller. Never told anybody about any of his needs, and they were massive. Six huge orphanages were built under the ministry of George Muller, under the hand of God, of course, in Bristol. Some of them are still there. Massive buildings, full of kids. He hadn't got two acnes until they rubbed together. During his lifetime, millions passed through his hands, but he, he just kept pouring it out. And because he could be trusted to pour it out, God kept giving it to them. 
And if you stack your money up, don't be surprised if God dries it up. If you pour it out, it'll keep coming. It applies to all the resources that we have. Whatever God has given us, He has given us that we might be the ministers of it. Sadly, sometimes we're the hoarders of it and we miss the blessing and we miss the joy. And the money stays there, but the spirit dries up. Can I put it like that? And so there was enough not only to pay the debt, to deal with all the creditors, but that she should live and her children of the rest. And so it was with that blind man in John 9. Once his eyes were opened, he didn't need to beg anymore. Now I've been in, I've been in financial pickles, as I'm sure you have. And I've been in situations where I've wondered, sometimes fretfully, you know, sadly to say, sometimes sinfully, is the money going to come? But it did. It did. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So here what we see is the supply of um, deliverance from debt. From the things that put us under pressure. The Lord Jesus can do that. But it's, it's him that does it and it's the Holy Ghost that does it. It's, it's, it just doesn't come naturally. I hope that's clear. Now I want to show you a couple of other places which I always associate with this passage. The first one is in Exodus 4 where we see a very similar situation and the supply of an altogether different need. Exodus chapter 4 where Moses now is being commissioned. This is before uh, he goes back to Egypt having fled from Pharaoh and lived out in the Midian desert as a shepherd and married uh, his wife out there he's now being sent back the Lord meets with him here on the mount uh, and the Lord is sending him back to um, Egypt Exodus chapter 4 verse 1 and Moses answered and said but behold they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice for they will say the Lord hath not appeared unto thee and the Lord said to him what is that in thine hand and he said a rod and he, that's the Lord of course, said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. What I want to say first of all about Moses, a very important lesson here. Moses of course was a little baby when he was discovered by Pharaoh's daughter in the Nile uh, in, a, in, a, in an ark, a basket, a little basket and, uh, and he grew up therefore as Pharaoh's son raised in the palace in, in uh, Egypt and probably he thought, knowing, him, knowing his Hebrew roots probably he thought in that, that, those first 40 years or so in Egypt that I am the man now, I'm going to be the Pharaoh and I'm the man that's going to deliver the children of Israel. He could see the bondage of his, of his brothers. And maybe felt that in time he would be the man. But he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. He was 40 years old. And he wasn't ready. He was relying too much perhaps at that time on his connections. The fact that he was of the Pharaoh's household. A wicked household as it happens. And so he had to learn the hard way. God gave him 40 years in the desert until all his pride was gone and all his sense of capability was gone and he felt himself to be nothing. And that's the state he's in now when he gets called. And many a young man gets called, gets saved and thinks I'm going to take the world by storm. Got some tough lessons to learn. Yeah, you've heard it said. Now I, I often criticise Bible college and uh, it, I think it depends what century you live in to be honest uh, but in this century generally speaking most of them are not worth the time of day in fact they're worse than that they're, they're places to be avoided for the most part like the plague but many a man supposes once he gets saved he gets really saved and he's keen to serve the Lord so he thinks what must I do I must go to Bible college and he supposes when he's done three years he's able to lead the people of God this was Moses error you've heard it many times you know the Lord Jesus lived for 30 years and ministered for three or studied if you will walked with God for 30 years and ministered for three with Bible college students it's the other way around 
They suppose they study for three and minister for 30. It's not enough, not good enough. And uh, it's in the hard lessons of life, it's the wilderness experience, where Moses, perhaps for 40 years, wondered whatever has happened to me, until he came to the place where now he's even reluctant. He's even reluctant to go and do what God is calling him to do. What had been God's will for him from the very beginning. But he wasn't ready the first time round. He'd got to be emptied. He'd got to learn the inadequacy of his flesh. He'd got to learn that mere natural connections and promotion were of no use. It is always, always going to be of the spirit. Now, again, we have here the same situation that we had with the woman and the pot of oil. Moses has got what he needs in his hand. What is that in thy hand? What hast thou in the house, says Elisha? God says here, what have you got in your hand? And all he got in his hand was a branch off a tree. Pharaoh had no doubt got a gold, jewelry encrusted scepter. Moses had got a branch off a tree. He never looked much probably when he went into the court with his branch in his hand, which speaks of the Lord Jesus. He's called the branch in the Bible, in capital letters in the KJV, as you probably know. But this branch, this rod, this branch off a tree, this, this mean looking scepter, this unimpressive scepter which became, this branch which became Moses' scepter was all he needed. God says throw it down. And when he threw it down he became a servant. And we have the gospel story here. How that Christ was cursed for us and God raised him up and he became the authority of God. And what God is giving to Moses here is authority. And that's something else we need. We need provision, we need deliverance from all the pressures of life, the claims of debt, the claims of the law, we need all those things, the pot of oil can do that. But we also need authority to uh, preach the word of God, to speak the word of God, to tell the word of God, to magnify the name. We need authority to do that. What did Moses say? Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. Now we are not told in this generation that we're to go out and cut a branch off a tree and go and wave it in front of Richard Dawkins or something. We're not told to do that. Our authority, our message is the gospel. And what Moses is, t is doing here is he's portraying the gospel. The branch cast down, the branch raised up. He was to take that branch as it were, a, it had become a snake. He was to take it personally and to pick it up again and it became Lo and behold, it became a rod in his hand. And this is the message. This is our authority. This is the heart of our message. This is our authority. And it's an authority that again comes from the Lord. God is calling Moses to do what he doesn't want to do anymore. He doesn't feel himself adequate anymore. And I had a, we had a brother come a while ago. and I was, In fact, a couple of brethren. But one came a while ago. And I said, is it all right if we record the message, brother? And he quite honestly, in all simplicity, said to me, well, if you want to, you know, I, I don't know whether it's worth it, but you can if you like. Well, that was a refreshing touch of humility. And he meant it, you know, and the guy's a capable preacher. I'm not going to tell you who it was. Capable preacher. But he thought, well, you know, maybe it's not worth recording. Now, when I first got saved, I said, you know, bring, I would have said, bring your tape recorders because this is going to be good. <laughs> I don't, tend, I don't tend to think quite so much that way, that way these days. I'm trying to remember a quote from um, Phillips Brooks. When a man, he, say, he says something to this effect, when a man first gets saved, he wonders that more people don't come and hear him. After a few years in the ministry, he's surprised that anybody comes at all. <laughs> That's growth, that's maturity. This is where Moses had got to. But the point that I'm making is what he needed, he'd got in his hand. If you're saved, you have got the authority of God in the gospel and we need to go with it. And Moses went with it and great things were done uh, in Egypt. One more place. I didn't make a note of the reference here so it uh, might take me a moment or two to find it but there's several times it's mentioned in the gospel. Uh, Mark chapter 6 Mark chapter 6 and verse 34 this passage is such a help to me I can't tell you and you know for anybody that does any preaching I know Andrew does and if anybody else does but if anybody does any preaching here this is such a help Mark chapter 6 verse 34 
and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place and now the time is far past. That doesn't mean to say it was all sand. It just means there are, it's, a, it's an uninhabited place is what it means. This is a desert place and now the time is far past. Send them away. The disciples now are telling the Lord what to do. Okay, The disciples are saying, we're smart Lord, here's what you need to do. Verse 36, send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. They're telling the same to do this. He answered and said, uh, he answered and said unto them, give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, shall we go and buy 200 pennyworth of bread and give them to eat? So now he's asking the impossible of his disciples. We know there were 5,000 men here. 5,000 men, the text says. So there may have been three or 4,000 women. There might have been 5,000 women. We're probably looking at, at a crowd of 15,000 at upwards, perhaps, and maybe more. And they haven't got any provisions, and the Lord says, give ye them to eat. See, they're in an impossible situation. The Lord is telling them to do something. They don't have resources to do it. Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give you... And the same thing comes up again here. How many loaves have ye go and see? And when they knew, they say five and two fishes. And in another place it says, and what are they amongst so many? It's just a little pot of oil. All I've got is a branch off a tree. We've just got five loaves and a few fishes. And what are they amongst so many? He puts them in an impossible situation. And he commanded them... To make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. That's the testimony of an eyewitness. That's the testimony of an eyewitness. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And I'll just say this as we pass through here. I think fifty is big enough for any church personally. We've been in churches, Gene and I, where there's 300. And you wear yourself out trying to talk to everybody. Fifty is a good number. Don't know where they will ever get there, God knows. But fifty is a good number. If your church gets to fifty, you need to be looking to plant one somewhere else if the Lord will. Verse 41, when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked, at, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the disciples, uh, blessed and break the loaves, sorry, and he gave them to his disciples to set before them, and the two fishes divided he among them all, and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments of the fishes. So in the widow's part of the world, you've got deliverance from bondage. With Moses you've got provision for authority and here you've got provision for sustenance and satisfaction. And I, time and time without number, I will go to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't feed these people. And I'm always brought back here. All you need is a little bit. Just break the little bit you've got. Bring that little bit to me and I'll, and I'll break it. And I believe he does. It, it's all of his mercy and it's all of his grace and he alone deserves the praise. Whatever you've got this morning, you've got all that you need. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Ghost. If you will listen to the Holy Spirit when he's prompting you to give the little that you have, you'll be blessed. And you'll find it keeps on coming. It keeps on coming. It keeps on coming. Whether it's money, whether it's energy, whatever it is, it keeps on coming. Some people live miserable lives because not, they won't give. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And if we're Christians, we ought to be generous people. God loveth a cheerful giver. You know you've heard it a thousand times. Cheerful is hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. George Muller was a hilarious giver. He just gave and gave. And because God could trust him as a steward, he just kept giving to George Muller. And George Muller's work just grew and grew. But God would have all the glory. And George Muller was on his knees. He was always on his knees. He died on his knees by his bedside at age 92. Having begun as a missionary at the age of 70. He died at his bedside on his knees at the age of 92. He always trusted the Lord for the provision. Now, Muller, I'm told, was not a fantastic preacher. But Spurgeon said he was a blessing to hear. You've got to be pretty good to please Spurgeon, I would have thought. And Spurgeon said Muller was a, it was a delight to go and hear Muller. But the point about Muller was he gave what God gave him. 
and this is what we need to learn I think here God my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus the need for deliverance from all your bondage and your pressures the need for deliverance from all the fears of financial risk and so on and so forth the need for authority that we might preach the gospel that we might speak the word of God with authority God is able to provide this and finally the need that we each have to be sustained some churches are starving to death and it isn't just because they haven't got a good preacher it's because they when they do get the word they don't pay any attention they have no appetite for it you know there is a there's an, an illness isn't the call is it bulimia or is it anorexia it's anorexia isn't it where they won't eat and then with bulimia they eat so much they keep being sick uh, you know in some churches the problem is i find there's no authority preach because there's no there's no hunger there there's no hunger there they said the old folks used to say hunger is the best cook there's no hunger there in these places and they're going to die the doors are going to shut i mentioned last night and i am i'm just rambling now i'll try and finish i mentioned last night that an anglican went into an anglican building on friday afternoon and the guy was telling me that the vicaress had just left last year and they got four churches and now they haven't got a vicaress that's not his word that's my word um, and clearly you know they've got these four enormous churches a handful of people uh, and they're in over their heads maybe just maybe had they been faithful with the word of God the candle would be burning I don't know the Anglican church seems to me to be in big trouble but let you let you and I not make that mistake my God I'll close with it my God is able to supply all your need for authority for sustenance and for deliverance according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus it's not enough to put the text on the wall these things need to be written in our hearts and we need to walk in them and then we shall see this kind of miraculous ministry amen